We are in week two of a two-week series, so this is the last week. It's called Home for the Holidays. And December is one of those months, it's full of joy and tradition and excitement and also anxiety and frustration uh, because not only do we get to hang out with the people that we love the most, but we also get to hang out with the people that sometimes may annoy us the most, all right? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. And uh, last week, it was funny because we, we talked about home for the holidays. We talked about expectations and reality, expectations versus reality. And, and if you didn't hear it, it was kind of like part one. It was sort of also the, the internal part of the series, kind of like dealing with ourselves and our expectations of life and of the holidays. But, uh, but today is we're going a step further, and we're talking about gr having gratitude and grace for the people that, is, that are in our life. And, and I believe that it's hard for us to show grace for people that we are not grateful for, and that's kind of where we're headed today in today's message. And so, um, so you know, with all of that being said, uh, last week we learned from someone that we all know and love about expectations versus reality, and this week we're going to learn from someone that we all know and love about being grateful for the people in our life, and we're going to learn from good old Clark Griswold. Yeah. <laughs> Touching it, it's getting redder. I got hemorrhoids. Can you believe that? Oh, mother. Isn't that terrible? Oh, You're not getting the garage space. You did no, my oh, I'm doing the parking. No. Russ, oh, you want to help me? They're not sleeping in my room. They want to go crazy. So there, sweetheart, your grandma know has got a real painful burr on my heel. And if you rub it for me, I'll give you a whole quarter. Okay? <laughs> a quarter. And I'll give Audrey a quarter, too, Audrey. I'm going to park my car in the garage. I'm going to park my car in the garage. I'm going to park my car in the garage. This is what Christmas is all about. I'll uh, park the cars and check the luggage, and uh, yeah, I'll be outside for a season. I'm sure he wants to come shopping and have lunch with us. He's got another car. He can drive. I have to eat so I can take my back pill.
Christmas is the time of year For being with the ones we love Sharing so much joy and cheer What a wonderful <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Bow your heads and close your eyes, you know. Um, <laughs> that doorbell scene, whenever they ring, it rings the doorbell. I mean, that is one of the, it's perfect. It's perfect. I mean, how many of you, you could picture yourself, you know what I'm saying? The family's there. You know what I'm saying? Well, we, we, so we have these uh, cameras in our driveway, and so whenever somebody drives up, you know, we get a notification. It's like, bing, you know, driveway camera, there's motion detected. So nowadays, it might not be the doorbell, but it's like, you know, you get the notification that somebody's dr- driven up, and you're like, it's family time. <laughs> All right, you know? But uh, it's funny, and we laugh about it because it's, it's true. Um, this past week, I had a, a few conversations with people who where it was like last week was fun when we talked about expectations and reality, but it was also like that's exactly how it is. It's how it feels. And, and again, it's people that we love, but what causes that moment of the doorbell ringing or you get the notification on the phone that family's arriving or whatever the case is, right? What causes that anxiety? What causes, for some people, it's dread. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Why do we feel that way? Not everybody does, but, but at some point you probably have or at some point you probably will uh, about, again, holidays or it could just be randomly in just, you know, the summertime, family getting together or you're getting together with people. What has caused the tension? What's caused the anxiety? And there's a lot of reasons why we feel that. It could be a lot of bad choices. It could be anger. It could be offense. Like if you, if you try to look back to the root causes of the frustration and the anxiety, for a lot of times there was an argument. There was somebody did something, you did something, and now it might have, ha- I mean, it might have happened 10 years ago, but it's, it's kind of devolved into this funky, like harsh, weird, and, bi- and like you don't even talk about it anymore. You just exist through it, and you just try to get through it. But whenever we start thinking about the causes of things, it might be personality conflict. It might be offense. uh, It might just be family dynamics. Just different families have different ways of doing things. You know, when me and my wife, we got married 17 years ago, uh, I mean, her family had a certain way of doing Christmas. My, had, my family had a certain way of doing Christmas. It was not the same. And, uh, you know, there were some funny things that happened I could go on and on about, about Christmas time. But um, uh, actually, in a podcast, I think it was last week, we, we, <laughs> we had some good conversations about, um, about some Christmas stuff that went down. You ought to check that out. But anyway, uh, so, but, but it, was a, it was a coming together of two different families, we have different ways of doing things, and it creates some tension, and then over time, again, as offense happens, or just, it's just life, y'all, all of a sudden, our relationships are, are negative. Uh, it, it might be different ways of doing things. It might be different takes on life, such as politics and religion. We talked about this in Thanksgiving as well. You know, you get around the table, and Uncle so-and-so has his thing that he needs to say about who's running for president or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? And he's got it figured out. He's got it figured out. He's had it figured out for many years. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's also a, a bit of a conspiracy theorist, and so there's a lot of fun with that as well. You know, it's like, it's just, it's all this stuff. And because every family's similar be, because we're people. We're all people. So some of it's just straight up, it's just humanity. It's just human flaws. You know what I'm saying? It's not that complicated, but we make it complicated. And so, um, but one thing about the holidays, and this is kind of what I want to help you with today, is, is I want you to understand that what the holidays do the holidays really just amplify whatever is going on in our life, in our families and in our relationships. It's like a volume knob and it just cranks up the volume. So for instance, if you have an unhealthy family, the, the holidays just amplify the unhealth that's already there. If you have a healthy family and, and things are good, it amplifies the healthy stuff, right? So all throughout the year, we can sort of just get away without 
thinking about it, talking about it. But all of a sudden, it's like, whose house are we meeting at? Are we getting together? You know what I'm saying? All the things. And it's like, we, we've got to come together in this. And that's why there's a lot of tension. And that's why this movie <laughs> that we laugh about is so real. But it's not always something that we can laugh about. I mean, I've been through stuff in my family. You can't laugh about it. It hurts. It's not good. It's, it's painful, but it's reality, you know? And so, so how do we navigate these complex emotions and these complex situations? You know what I'm saying? How do, we, how do we get guidance and direction through these things? I wanna give you some simple things today, guys. Number one is, is that you need to change your perspective, your point of view of people and circumstances. Uh, uh, your point of view is simply this, and I, I talk about this a lot. You know, I'm looking, if, if, if you're looking at my phone right now, you're looking at this side of it, and you see the camera, and you see just the, the case, and then I'm looking this way, and I see the, the actual screen of the phone, and we could both be explaining and uh, what the phone looks like and what's going on, and both of us are not wrong, it's just different perspective, but the way that you look at something completely changes the way that you process that. And so if you have a negative or an improper or a, a a lens over you, you know, your eyesight, your perspective of a person in your life, then all you can see is that. A circumstance. You have your own take on what happened, and that's all you can see, and it's real to you, and it doesn't mean that it's not true, your perspective. It's just that it is your perspective. And so you gotta change your perspective in order to change your reaction to people. And uh, we can choose to see the things about people that we like or the things that we don't like. And this is tough right here. I can choose to accentuate the things in you that I like or that I dislike. I can, I can choose to see the things about you that I consider to be like an asset, something that's positive, or I can see something in you and just focus upon the liabilities about that person, the things I don't like about them. Last week, we talked about optimism and pessimism in regards to expectations. This week is, is really about, again, how we see people. And your perspective of people is a huge deal. Imagine getting to the place, though, where you can get past just seeing what you like about someone and begin to look at the things that you don't like about them, but not seeing it in a negative way, but getting to a place of understanding of why they are the way that they are. Let's just think about this for a second. Think about the person right now that, that you're not really looking forward to seeing in the next couple of weeks. Let's just, let's just take this as an example. Think about the thing that you don't like about them. Now, I want you to ask the question, why are they the way that they are? I want you to think back to maybe how they were raised. Think back to maybe some really hard experiences that they went through, which has shaped the way that they are. They're not the way that they are just to annoy you. <laughs> they don't wake up every day thinking, man, I can't wait today to frustrate so-and-so. No, they are the way that they are. Maybe it's just basic personality conflict. Maybe it's just, you know, humanity. But also you have to realize and come to a place of understanding of maybe they're living through wounds. Maybe they're living through past hurts. And they're so defensive because of something that has happened to them. What I'm talking about is understanding, and understanding leads to compassion. And whenever we have a compassionate under, a perspective of someone, we treat them differently. It is the way that Jesus approached his relationships. It's the way that Jesus approached his disciples. Y'all listen, Jesus was sitting around at the Last Supper with his disciples, knowing exactly who had already turned their back on him, who had already uh, uh, you know, sold him out, guys who in, in a matter of hours were going to be leaving him, right? And he still loved them, and he still prayed with them, and he still served them because he had eyes of compassion, and he also had purpose in his heart. He knew what he was on earth to do. And he led with, anytime that you see Jesus do anything for someone else, you see this element of compassion in him. And compassion isn't just a feeling, it's coupled with action. And so you have an understanding of the people and, and the way that they are that they are. And by the way, I, I want you to know this, 
Nick, you ain't so perfect yourself. <laughs> All right, let's just kind of put that in the mix a little bit. All right, you're like, oh my gosh, they're so annoying. <laughs> and it's like, maybe you're kind of annoying too. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you got your own little things as well. Maybe, maybe you're the one that they, whenever they hear the doorbell ring, bong, bong, it's you. You're sitting there with, you know, you're all excited, got presents, and they're just like, oh, God. You know? We always think it's the other person, but sometimes we're, <laughs> we're the grandma talking about the, the mole on the neck or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like. <laughs> when, uh, but a big part of the changing of perspective, of course, in this funny movie that we're using that as, as an example today is, is uh, he starts seeing this old film, that, you know, the old video. And uh, I, I think that Clark began to be grateful for his family. He began to look back and say, man, you know, they're kind of weird, but this is, this is my family. And I can, either be, I can either resent them or I can be grateful for them. And I believe that should challenge us. I think that we should look and say, man, my family... My friends, the people that are in my life, I've got one life to live, and this is the family that I've got. And I can either make it better, and I can, you know, by my perspective and the way that I approach it, having compassion and being led in this way, or I can make it worse. A lot of times, guys, the way that we go into situations and circumstances in our life, it really does determine how bad or how good it, it, it is. All right? So, gratitude. Gratitude is a perspective that changes the way that we see and treat people. And this is sort of the definition of it. Gratitude is, is being thankful and being ready to show appreciation and give kindness to people. That you are ready to show kindness to someone that, that you really don't feel like showing kindness to. First Thessalonians says this, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances. I would maybe kind of add a little bit maybe for today and say give thanks in for all the people in your life. <laughs> give thanks to God for them. And it says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul had gone, the apostle Paul went through so many things in his life, so many difficulties, and still he stood and he wrote letters like this and he said, even in spite of all this, I still give thanks to God in all of the circumstances that I encounter because I know that God is doing something in me and he's going to do something through me. That's sort of what we talked about last week. But he says, this is the will of God. I want, I want to challenge you with that, that the will of God for you with the people that are in your lives and the circumstances that you are in is, is actually to approach those people in those circumstances with a grateful heart. Notice he doesn't say in the good circumstances give thanks. He says in all circumstances. And, and, and I, I would apply that to our families. As we encounter these difficult, sometimes holiday seasons, all right, and gatherings, man, isn't it wonderful that we can get together? Isn't it wonderful that we have the freedom to get together? Isn't it wonderful that we have, to, that we have the, the finances to buy presents? I mean, like... That, like we're gonna get together, and it's not are we going to have food, it's just how much food are we going to have. Like, I'm, y'all, our perspective sometimes is so negative, and I believe it's because we don't have a grateful heart, which may sound sort of like a thin surface sermon for some of you today, but I wanna let you know, gratitude is, is deep. It's, 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 it, it reveals something deep down in the core of who we are, and so it's not thin, but gratitude leads to this next point. When we are grateful for people, that's whenever we can extend grace to people. If I am not grateful for, t for you, I am not going to extend grace to you. Just, it, it, it's almost like, it's almost one equals the other. If, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna show grace to people that I'm, I don't understand, that I don't have compassion for, right? I'm not, I'm not gonna do that, and so then I'm, I'm not grateful for them. And so if I'm not grateful for you, I won't be graceful toward you. And grace, I'll put it like this, grace is giving someone slack even though they don't deserve it. You see, we, we justify not giving grace to people that we feel don't deserve it. Like, you need to earn my grace. You need to earn, a, like a, you know what I'm saying? You need to earn this. And that's how we approach this trans, a lot of these transactional relationships we have with people. We judge, y'all have heard this, come on. We judge a lot of people by their worst day, and we judge ourselves by our best day. 
We, we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, that's not what I meant. Yeah, but that's what you did. You know? We, we, we always kind of, we just give ourselves a lot of grace because we know ourselves. We have compassion on ourselves. But we don't do that to others. And, you know, again, we have to ask the question, though, why does all of this happen? Why are we right now sitting in a room like this, listening to someone talk about these issues and, and, and teach about this type of perspective? How did we get here? Well, so remember, you know, earlier we talked about how all the reasons that there are, there's tension, there's awkwardness, and there's drama. Ultimately, those things originate, they originate from sin. This, every problem that we have, every issue that we have, if you trace back the root system of it, it goes back to sin. Sin fractured creation. It broke our relationship with God, but it also broke our relationship with one another. I heard a pastor years ago teach on this. He said the great, one of the greatest things that sin, the biggest things that sin destroyed was intimacy or closeness. Closeness with God, close proximity with God, and close proximity with others. And here we are, and it's just playing out in our life. So whenever you think about the, the family drama that you're dealing with, the hurt that you deal with, it all goes back to sin. That's the, that's the original place where it comes from. And so the issue is, or the, the, the thing is, is, whenever we diagnose all of these problems that we sort of laugh about sometimes, okay, when we diagnose these problems as sin, it changes the way that we react to those things. And guess what? If we label all of these issues as originating from sin, then we can react to sin in the same way that God reacts to sin. Now, in one sense, God judges sin, right? And he is going to ultimately judge all of us, right? But God also reacts to sin with grace and mercy. That's his reaction. The Bible says that where sin abounds, grace abounds, now, because grace abounds, do we just keep on sinning and abuse the grace of God? Of course not. Paul makes that point in, in Romans. But it doesn't negate the fact also that where sin abounds, grace abounds. And so if we, recognizing people with all of their issues, and ours as well, and we have compassion and we are grateful and we can extend grace to people, and if we look at those issues as sinful issues, not just personality conflicts and all that kind of stuff, right? We look at it as sin issues. Then we can actually react with grace as God does. Does that make sense? And the, the, the other added thing to this is that it's not an option for Christians. It, it's actually not optional for Christians to respond to sin with grace it's, it's not, it, we don't have the option to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. Why? Because we are believers in the gospel. We are believers in the good news of Jesus, which ultimately is this, is that God has, ex has extended his grace to each and every one of us. And so how can we not extend grace and mercy to others? God has forgiven us, so how can we not forgive others? Whenever we talk about having a Christ-centered life or a gospel-centered life, this is the way that the gospel uh, is integrated into to our lives and, and, and affects the way that we express ourselves to other people. It changes the game. It changes the standard of living for us as believers. And we're commanded to do this. Now, now I want to say one quick caveat before we read this last scripture. I understand that for some of you, whenever you hear me speak on this right now, you're, you're thinking of uh, kind of easier to deal with issues. Again, personality conflicts, maybe some stuff's been said in the past that hurt you and all that kind of stuff. But then there's others of you that it's a lot deeper than that. It's more what, what you would consider, or maybe it is abuse. And, and when we're talking about abuse, verbal, emotional uh, uh, physical abuse, 
I don't want, man, I always like to, to make sure that people understand the process for you may look a little bit longer to, to, to really deal with some of the hurt all right, and so what I'm not saying today is snap your fingers and all this is gonna be good in two weeks for that person that said things to you or did things to you that has literally altered, altered your life, okay? I understand it's a process, but still for all of us, this is the goal. This is, this is the goal. It says this in Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And instead of that, Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And this is, the hook, this is the hook right here. As God in Christ forgave you. Again, this is the meat, y'all. This is the reason that we forgive. This is the reason that we show up to Christmas, even though we might not want to, with a big old smile on our face. Tenderhearted, extending grace to others, whether or not they deserve it. Everybody smile real quick. Yeah. Come on. I know it's not that, that easy. I'm, I'm a person too, okay? And so, so I, I want you to know that. But at the same time, the way, this is what the word of God does to me. The word of God, it, it's like, you know, when two pieces of, of metal hit each other, there's sparks that fly. That's what happens inside of my soul whenever I hear things like this or I read things like this. It, it, it pushes up against something deep in the core of who I am. And this is what I call the thing that the word is pushing up against. You know what I call that, that thing? I call it my pride, my selfishness. I call it sin in my heart. That's what the word is pushing up against. And so the way that I try to approach that moment is to say, Lord, you're convicting me once again. You're showing me where I'm falling short of the standard that you've set. But not only are you gonna show me that, that I'm weak in this area, but you're gonna empower me with your, with your spirit and you're gonna give me the grace to actually extend to others. And that comes through prayer. That comes through being around other people who are like-minded and are on the same path. It comes through much forgiveness over and over and over. Before you get out that car this, this month for that, that holiday, right, you might need to pray. As a family, you might need to turn on some worship music on the way to that gathering, you know, and, and crank it up loud. You know what I'm talking about? And before you step foot into that, that house or whatever it looks like, pray. I can tell you this, it's hard to hold on to, to unforgiveness and bitterness whenever you pray for somebody. Uncle so-and-so that annoys you so much, j just start praying for him. Your heart will change. You know what I'm saying? Your parents, your kids, whatever. I'm, I'm just, I'm giving you some advice today, some spiritual advice. Start praying for him and you'll see your heart change because what, what happens is the same compassion that Jesus had for others, he'll fill you with that compassion. And I believe that's God's goal for us.